You good? Yes. Gotcha. All right. Excellent. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mike Gresselisi, co-owner here of Synergy Software Design, uh, based out of DC. Um, we've been working with the Navy for years now, um, specifically around their virtual environment um, that we are writing for them and deploying. Um, we have an existing system called Spiders 3D that uh, we just did a case study for specifically to combine data uh, with uh, the 3D environment. Uh, there is information that uh, sits behind uh, the firewalls and a lot of our applications need to get to that information. Um, what we're doing is we're calling this data informed decisions. Our goal on Spiders 3D is to actually support data informed decisions rather than knee jerk reactions and or poorly informed decisions. Um, we know that we have a lot of data, especially in the Navy, and we're not um, unique to this. Uh, we also know that web applications bring all sorts of things together, different data warehouses and technical capabilities. What we did was we built that on, on that concept, the ability to uh, combine 3D with the other web-based technologies that we build to help uh, increase reliability, scalability, and predictability for these data-informed decisions. A little background on the problem is that um, there's a general lack of data awareness across the enterprise. And this doesn't matter if it's whether or not it's the Navy or um, pretty much any other institution. Um, it reduces the stakeholders ability to make these, in these decisions and it increases risks. The other problem that we have is that, you know, once you get to that part, three other pieces start showing up. Number one is you might have tribal knowledge and this goes into the idea that there are people who have been working on a job for 20, 25 years and they just know how it works. Problem is they're going to retire and uh, getting that information back out into the workforce and helping making decisions across the enterprise. That's very difficult. Second is some people don't want to show the data because it might actually show some bad things. And in that situation, um, there is, uh, you know, an apprehension of actually showing everything that you've got. The third one is you may have easy data, but you don't have easy access to it. So there's a lot of people who have gone through and done data collections. There's a lot of uh, Excel spreadsheets, but it's just not a repeatable thing. So, um, so the way that we organized it and we attacked the problem was to leverage those things and identify that we can mitigate the problems that they, 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 um, uh, that they show. We're gonna leverage also what already exists. We know that there's a ton of data out there in our enterprise. And we also know that if we just increase our capability a little bit to give access to those data sets, we should have a lot of, uh, uh, of, of good benefits here. So how do we mitigate a tribal knowledge? Well, visualize. Um, one of the hardest things to do uh, that we know of is uh, to get someone's take on a physical situation. So we said, hey, if we can visualize it in 3D, almost everyone can say, yes, that is, or no, no that isn't the way. The second one is fear of the data. If we mitigate this by just saying, here is alternatives one, two, and three very easily, you, you basically don't have an ability to hide the data and you're just saying, we're going to address this one problem in four different ways. And then last one is just removing the barriers to that, that data. If you can make it so easy to get to inf information that was usually buried in a report somewhere, then everyone has access to make those decisions. So we know that tribal knowledge will only go so far um, it doesn't cross the physical location boundaries. We know that uh, the data, you know, if you're working with budgets, maybe that won't be enough to do anything. And then, uh, you know, unless you're an actual database person and you want to make your data, uh, you know, usable across the thing, it's very difficult to put it all together in a repeatable way. Basically, we're just trying to do a, uh, uh, risk analysis and risk mitigation. So if you do data informed decisions, you're going to see greens in cost training, readiness, safety, and quality. If you do it based off of tribal knowledge, 
Every single one of those is at risk. So we like, we, we brought this out as increasing data awareness through new tools. So overall, we wanted to just re reduce the amount of time it takes to get to information so that you can make these data informed decisions. What we have done is we've combined uh, enterprise databases with the 3D um, environment. And that gives us an ability to use the metadata in the 3D to query information in the database. Overall, Spiders 3D has three major aspects of it that help communicate this information. Um, we have project timeline, which allows us to put together a um, uh, order of events. And the 3D presentation mode says that we're going to take uh, different uh, images and setups of different 3D model um, configurations, ass assign them to a, a, a project timeline event. And then you can physically go and step through uh, a project timeline in 3D. And what we did for this data study was to add data slides to the project timeline. So not only can we go and see a physical movement of an object, but we can now go and say, hey, I want to know the condition of the, the, the deck that that um, uh, object is going on. Our goals ultimately are to create innovative and web, uh, web and 3D based communications, remove barriers, increase the pace of quality decision making that increases the data awareness and availability. Quick demonstration, we'll see how this works. Um, let me see here, probably gotta go to this. This guy here. One second. Share. All right, I am going to share that. Okay. All right, so in our environment, uh, first of all, just a thumbs up or uh, okay that you can see a 3D stuff. Yes, we got it. Thanks. All right, so in our environment, we have a fully geospatial 3D environment. What we're showing right now is the data slides aspect of this. Uh, we can go in and uh, select any object that you see in here and get information on that object. So we're going to just dive in and uh, select something here like that uh, fender. And as we are on the fender, it gives us the ability to see the data that we have behind it. So down here we have data that is associated with that fender. What's cool about this whole thing is that with X3D and X3DOM, which is what we're using, we're able to then build the application that now shows in perspective 3D data for users. So this is a very important aspect of trying to communicate information to people. So we've been able to put this together so that um, while we are going through and making a presentation, we can also tell people that the condition of your piles, the condition of your peer is good or bad for the decisions that you want to make. Uh, so with that, let's see here, let's go back to this page. Okay. All right. So with that, I'll give you a quick little screenshot of what it was. And then what was our outcome? At the end of the day, we added the capability to link enterprise data with geometry in X3D. We made a simple and user-friendly and powerful communications tool extends the presentation layer of X3D for businesses and stakeholders. Overall, it was a great one. Uh, we, we really like doing that. And uh, like I said, if you guys, and this is my contact information, um, please post any QA uh, that you have uh, into the, the Zoom Q&A here. Uh, and with that, I'm going to uh, throw it over to Daryl uh, from NIH, and they're going to talk a little bit more about 3D printing. Thank you. Appreciate that introduction, Mike. Thank you. And um, so just to uh, kick it off, I'm joined by my uh, co-founder of the NIH 3D Print Exchange, Dr. Megan McCarthy, and she'll be uh, sharing uh, slides and screen. 
But let me just uh, introduce it by saying that the the NIH is a group of 27 centers and institutes, and it is the largest biomedical funding organization in the world. The National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, which is the institute to which uh, Megan and I belong, is the second largest of the National Institutes of Health. Uh, and it is, of course, uh, led by Dr. Anthony Fauci, who maybe you've seen on the TV recently. We started the NIH uh, 3D Print Exchange back in uh, 2013 or so. And I had been using uh, X3D and associated technologies since at least 2007 when we started 3D printing some of our biomedical models and proteins and that kind of thing. Uh, and even before that, I was uh, interested in the technology as a protein crystallographer. Uh, since that time, we realized that the, the printing of these objects is something that is of value to the researchers that we associate with. And we said, well, why don't we automate this and make this available for the whole world? That's the reason that we built the 3D print exchange. One of the core foundation, uh, foundational technologies in the 3D print exchange is the use of the X3D format. We use it because some of the software that we use to create uh, the models that are on the, X, on the 3D print exchange, the native output format is X3D. So the use of open source technologies and open specs has been a part of the, uh, has kind of shaped the NIH 3D print exchange. And uh, we continue to use it today. In fact, uh, X3D was, uh, as Anita pointed out earlier, was one of the key uh, technologies used to do previews for the, uh, our response to the COVID-19 supply chain crisis. In the early days of COVID-19, people weren't able to get um, face shields and other kinds of uh, devices that would usually be produced uh, in a uh, like an injection molding kind of process. And so they turned to the, to the NIH 3D Print Exchange as a place to share designs that could be printed in a person's home or in the lab uh, to, to address the shortage of personal protective equipment that was happening at the time. Uh, now the exchange continues to be used for exchanging those, but the, the need is not quite the same as it was in the early days of the, uh, the COVID-19 crisis. Megan, would you like to go ahead and, and present? Sure, yeah, I'll just, um, let's see if I can share my screen. Can you guys hear me okay? I hear you, please go ahead. Great. Sorry, I'm trying, here we go. This is so many monitors. Great, um, so I'll just give you some, some visuals to, to cover what Daryl shared there. Um, this is an example of where we fit in this, uh, this massive uh, government institute under NIH and, and DHHS. Um, with the keeping that we're in the Office of Cyber Infrastructure and Computational Biology, which gives us a lot of, um, uh, you know, freedom to kind of do these kind of projects that are maybe a little bit different than the standard. Uh, this is the one of the, uh, an example, one of the prints that Daryl, he, he mentioned going back to 2007. Um, we saw how valuable that was, and now that's been extended into virtual and augmented reality. Um, so here's one of our colleagues, Phil Cruz, with um, this gentleman, you, you may recognize uh, with the VR headset is Bill Gates, came to visit our vaccine research center. Um, and, and we used VR to uh, what we call, uh, show him, we call molecular spelunking, where you can actually go inside of a model and, and uh, molecular model and see things that you couldn't see before. Uh, and that uses a tool called Chimera X, which uh, or Chimera from University of California, San Francisco. And I'll, I'll tell you more about that in a moment. So here's some example from the 3D print exchange. So it's molecular models, uh, medical uh, and anatomical models, and also um, custom uh, uh, printable uh, labware and other uh, devices. Um, we are, we've created a biovisualization lab 
um, within our, our offices. We, we took up our giant uh, conference room and we've outfitted it with all kinds of um, VR headsets and, and augmented reality uh, tools. And we are working on uh, developing content for that. One of, one of which is through um, a platform called Indubo, um, and that will actually take X, X3D models. Um, and that I, we think that has an exciting future for using VR uh, training, uh, virtual reality for training and education in the future. So an example of these, these pipelines that, that I believe Daryl mentioned um, is that we're using open source tools. And in fact, we have contributed code back to um, uh, versions of Blender and to uh, the Cura 3D, plate, 3D slicing engine, um, particularly for the latter to incorporate X3D import into Cura to support 3D printing of files in an X3D format, which of course benefits us given that we have all these X3D files. Um, and those are generated through um, various ways from direct upload of STL or, or vermal files for monochrome and, and um, color printing respectively. Um, we generate the X3D for the viewers. And uh, at the same time, we can also take raw 3D structure data, um, whether it's from an imaging stack like a DICOM or um, an, a, a, a protein data bank file or similar, which are essentially just atomic coordinates, a, a point cloud of um, uh, atoms in space that represent that structure. And that would be taken from um, uh, e experimental scientific uh, results. Uh, so here's an example, and through that one pipeline, so we've taken that raw data file, we've generated uh, six different representations of it, or three representations, and we present those um, in, in color and in monochrome. Uh, users, I'm, I'm not showing this live because um, typically that never works out for me to, to switch back and forth. We won't, we won't. Um, test that today live. Um, but uh, so from this one structure file, we actually generate six thumbnails, six X3D in the XML format. We also generate six of the um, progressive, the, the, the binary X3D encoding that gets displayed in the viewer. And then we also pull a lot of metadata that comes from the um, the structure file itself. And this one in particular is generated from our quick submit tool that a user can enter the database identifier. In this case, it was the, the PubChem database. All they need to do is enter that and all of this metadata and the structures and um, the new ones that, that we generate um, are just based on that one. Um, takes 30 seconds, log in, and you're there. Um, and in a few minutes, you, you get an email with a link to your uh, model. I'll say three minutes, um, de depends a little bit longer, depending on the complexity of the structure. Um, we're also doing a lot with DICOM visualization, and I've mentioned Chimera, that tool uh, that we use for molecular structure conversions. They've extended that into a new tool called Chimera X, which I believe is just point, just went into its 1.0 version um, maybe like a month or two ago. And um, they've done some really amazing things with the rendering for um, DICOM, DICOM files, which are essentially the, the image stacks that make up uh, an MRI or a CT. Um, our goal is to make 3D data accessible and transferable. Next year, we will be releasing NIH3D, which is 3D.nih.gov, not 3D print. And the idea is that um, these, the assets are going to, you know, in, in 2013, 3D printing was becoming mainstream for and affordable for consumers. And these the tools that um, that that Daryl built actually um, ex allow they they lower the adoption barrier for for um, naive users or non scientific users to get to those models and then of course people can go and share their own but X3D can be used in 
in all kinds of ways. And so what we want to do is sort of embrace the broader spectrum of 3D technologies uh, and incorporate more in different file formats and uh, types of content, all, all of which related to bioscientific and, and anatomical content. Um, I'll just briefly, uh, Mike mentioned metadata and, um, and Anita before that. We are very interested in that, in, in file formats that can embed that within a 3D header to support things like attribution and licensing and um, the uh, source experimental data. And then at the same time with applications to support 3D printing and visualization in a medical setting, where um, you know you really want to make sure that you're looking at what um, you know what is specific to that patient, and all of that metadata, of course, would travel with the 3D model rather than having just um, geometry. So um, uh, I'll, I'll mention so briefly if you are interested in looking at or printing out models of SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, um, please visit our collection there. Um, and on the right, I'll just show uh, our director of the NIH, Francis Collins, um, loves to use these. We delivered that one to his house during the lockdown so that he could bring it to a Senate subcommittee hearing. Um, we've also just released um, uh, in the iOS and Android app stores, uh, an augmented reality app called Pathogen AR, where you can go and interact with 3D models in an augmented reality environment, whether it's just through touching the screen or using on the right here, um, this little, uh, essentially it's a toy called a, a Merge Cube, which you can get for between around $10 at Walmart or Amazon or anywhere online. Um, and then with regard to the COVID-19 response and the shortage of PPE available to healthcare workers, we realized um, that, that there was so much out there in the open source community that could be printable, that could be used, and people were using this to respond. And what we did is we partnered with the US Food and Drug Administration, the Veterans Healthcare Administration, and uh, America Makes, which is uh, a non, uh, which is uh, a, a non, nonprofit public private partner uh, and together we um, sort of the goal was to have a collection of models that were they are assessed by the VHA sort of to find things that are optimized for use whether it's in a clinical or community setting so I encourage you to go check that out especially if you have a 3d printer our focus right now is on supporting um, 3D printing, 3D printable nasal swabs, um, because those are in a shortage right now. Uh, there's several shortages, and um, unfortunately, there uh, is more activity going on now with 3D printing because we, we are having, um, you know, a resurgence of cases and a need for that. Um, anyways, this is just um, some stats about that collection. Um, whoops, didn't get rid of those. I encourage you to go look at our scripts on GitHub. That's all available. And at this, we, our models are available to download for free. You can share your own um, X3D as well as STL and WRL files. Uh, and when we go into NIH3D, we're going to be incorporating many more 3D file formats. So here's um, some of our acknowledgments, including to the Web3D Consortium. And I invite you to contact contact us if you have any questions. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Megan. You can see we're very enthusiastic about uh, X3D and 3D technology in general. Uh, and we certainly do welcome your, your questions and feedback, but I'd like to now introduce Chris Lane, who is the uh, founder and CEO of 3DMD, who will be our next speaker. Hopefully everybody can see my screen. Well, I've heard nothing, so we've not. Um, I'm gonna try and move things on a little bit of a pace here, but I want to talk about another, another dimension to this, which is a lot of the work that's been going on with regard to human scanning. And it's a bit of a sad presentation because I'm presenting a slide that I thought 20 years ago, I wouldn't be presenting for probably another year, and yet still 20 years on, we're presenting it. Um, and that's this one. Um, 
we've been talking a lot about printing things for humans, but it's very important to understand humans themselves. And still we have millions of humans that are enrolled in these legacy formats. Um, and I think it's a rather strange situation that um, one of the most important things going forward in the CB19 era is to understand people and human movement, whether it's the understanding of genetics for biomarkers or whether it's through to making something that keeps them safe and enables them to communicate at the same time, or whether it's replicating human movement for things like robotics. Um, uh, there's a lot of challenges going forward, and yet most of the data out there remains in proprietary legacy formats. Um, we ourselves put one together way back in January 99. It was supposed to be a temporary format. Um, it was a very simple thing. We wanted a, a lot of our customers were, were disassociating and orphanating their OBJ files. They'd split the three things across directories. So we came up with a file container called TSB. It was supposed to last about 12 to 15 months um, before we saw something else coming in place. Much to our horror, um, 10 years later, um, the American Dental Association did a survey of people doing human scanning and discovered that our TSB format was actually the most widely used format for dental scanning. Consequently, it was decided when DICOM decided to look at a working group into a recommendation, it had to be backwards compatible with TSB. It wasn't that difficult, but that's sort of challenge. Does it matter? Yes, uh, this is from a presentation I gave at the Royal School of Medicine in London uh, last year. Um, and it's a very sad case. This is an orthodontist who dedicated uh, something like 15 years of research into studying particular conditions of kids with facial deformity, such as cleft lip and, cleft lip and palate. Um, much at well, some stage during his research, his, um, uh, his sponsor had asked him to use a different technology. He discovered that five years of his work was locked into a proprietary format, um, losing a discontinuity. Fortunately, we discovered that proprietary format was actually a rip of a TSB file and found a way of decoding it. But the sheer horror of losing 20 years of potential research and data with the thirst for knowledge we have on the human form at the moment is something we must take very seriously. So yes, we need standards. Um, this is a fairly simplistic way of looking at data. Um, nowadays, we're looking at potentially looking at hundreds of landmarks on the face. Um, one of the big areas of enormous interest is the genetics of the face. Um, as I mentioned earlier on biomarkers, can they indicate if somebody is ill, sick? Um, are they more reliable than doing a temperature check? Well, I've got a feeling they probably are in terms of those areas. It's a fairly simplistic way of doing it. But immediately we introduce the idea that it's not just about points and texture. It's about an awful lot more collateral information than just a simple scan. So one of the early ways in which we can look at the extensibility of a data container is actually to put these landmarks in the same container as, um, uh, as, as the data itself, um, therefore not needing to have orphanated CSV files all over the place. Um, and this is the sort of sophistication. This is just looking at landmarking on the air. Again, if we're looking at things like wearable technologies we have to wear comfortably, Interesting enough, the most, uh, one of the, the hottest areas of, of infrastructure on the face is the area underneath the ear at the moment. Um, it's a great place to put computers, batteries, and things like this. So there's a lot of inquisitivity about the human body and the need to get to those areas. Um, Anita talked about the IEEE group on body processing. Um, they, in turn, are actually implementing an ISO standard, which is, I think, 96 standard landmarks on the body. And we can begin to see the importance of continuity in the supply chain here. We scan the young lady in a T-pose, that generates a whole series of landmarks and markers that probably go back to Victorian tailors. That in turn goes into um, various types of alignments and we can see right at the end, we're looking at the concept of producing a pattern that would allow her dress to be made automatically. So again, this whole supply chain and the concept of 3D, it goes through several life, life cycles and paths on this. And it intersects with several different standards on the subject. Um, if we look at why this is important to us is our first project was a very simple thing. Um, we had to produce a system, uh, I think it was the Barkson uh, London Hospital, which looked at combining a thermal texture map with a, um, a physical texture map for the idea of beginning to look at managing swelling after a dental intervention. There was no other format we could use for this, again, other than having 
orphanated files. So the idea within a single X3D container, we can we contain those non-standard maps. The second thing we looked at was cleaning up a lot of these landmark systems so we put the CSE files in place. Um, and then as we move on to other areas, the beauty with X3D is you can have a whole series of private proprietary things in there which either preempt or ahead of standards or represent something highly proprietary. And one of the things that's very important to us is beginning to give connectivity between how we render points, how we decide something's in a 3D model with the analysis and using it. Um, why do we make a decision to optically put a point in a given coordinate location? And when we start tracking the movement of those points in a 4D system, um, how can we learn from how we put that in place by, um, by looking at the decisions we made in the first place? Which means we're not just carrying coordinate information from the rendering phase into the analysis phase, we're carrying a whole lot of other information. Often we don't even know what we want to carry until we've tried different, different approaches. That's a great aspect of machine learning. It's uh, let's try this, see what happens. Hey, this works, let's build on that machine learning. You've got to have a very powerful container for that and therefore X3D becomes the backbone within everything we do for holding that information going forward. Equally, there's lots of interesting tools out there and so on. Um, we use Unity a lot because it has some great features in. Um, it happens to have GLTF in. Fine, we can put GLTF in an X3D container. So um, we use the parts of it which are necessary, but we get that cross-fertilization there. So that metadata extensibility on how we use it is enormously important. It allows us to move forward. Again, in previous talks, um, we've talked about the importance of security and traceability. That's the single most thing that's holding people back from exploiting human data at the moment is the fear of um, data protection, data standards, and so on. Um, there's no question that some of the close security aspects that exist within X3D make it, and I too careful on this because it's not there, but ready for ideas like blockchain and so on. And then finally, um, uh, I'm gonna finish by talking a lot more about 4D and the concept of 4D made up, being made up of a series of autonomous or uh, a sequence of 3D models. Um, there's no question X3D preempts that and can be made to work in that environment. So concluding on where we might want to go, um, this is how rich uh, 4D data can get. Um, we have a young lady here. Um, this is about a second of her life slowed down and it's something like, uh, I think it's 120 3D frames captured per second. And we just see how rich the capability of that data is. Um, we can look at her thigh movement, her thigh muscles moving on this. So in that one second of capture, we have an enormous amount of information about that young lady and her training regime and so on. And Looking forward to it, and just to conclude on the potential of this data, I just look at one aspect of a guy doing a skateboard trick in there, and we've pulled out a series of vectors on uh, the angle at which he hits the approach of the skateboard. So the message here is to say, um, we're not at the end of the path with regard to 3D human data, we're just at the beginning. And when we have the ability to capture these rich data sets with actually very little social contact or um, with complete social distancing, distancing, we have a great opportunity to learn more and more about the human form that can help us through the next tricky decade. Thanks for your attention. Be happy to get questions later on. I believe I'm next on the agenda. My name is um, Mike McCann. I'm uh, software engineer at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. And I'm going to talk a bit about our use case, and that is using um, X3D and X3DOM for visualizing oceanographic data. And I'm going to be showing some just some small examples of how we're using open source software and X3D uh, to visualize data that come from robots. And it's, and it's gonna be from this campaign that we just conducted in the ocean, ocean research in a time of COVID-19. And this is on our public website, www.ambari.org. And I won't go into a lot of detail on this, um, on this news article. Um, you can read it, but here's a picture of some of our robots that we can deploy in the ocean. And the timing of um, having to go on lockdown with our rising capabilities and robotic oceanographic uh, measurements 
is fortuitous because it takes just two or three people to deploy these robots and they can stay at sea for um, several weeks. And we have both submersible and surface platforms uh, plying the oceans off Moss Landing, California over uh, Monterey Submarine Canyon. So I'll be demonstrating some of the, the data um, um, from this campaign using um, X3D. So let me present this, um, this slide set. And something interesting that happened during this campaign is two weeks ago today, uh, one of our submersibles got bit by a shark. And so we, um, so the ocean sometimes bites back. We published this as a, as a social media report on our Facebook page. And I thought, well, we've got this technology to, to visualize that, that data. So I extracted a, a 10 Hertz sample of the, um, the IMU data from the vehicle that we managed to recover and download. And this is its path played back in real time as it's steering itself upwards in the water column. On the right panel, you see the pitch and the roll sensor data. Um, and this is when the shark hits it, bites, clenches the whole robot and its teeth, and it pitches it and then now rolls it pretty violently. And it hangs onto it for, for 20 seconds or so and then um, figures that it's not uh, a seal with nice fleshy uh, blubbery uh, skin, but instead a, a hard fiberglass surface. So then let's go. So this, uh, this is one example of using uh, X3D. The, the panel in this web page is a X, X3DOM panel and the software on the right is, is all open source. Um, another example of using the, the same tool. This is the Stokes web application. This is um, a, a few days worth of, of sensor measurements of upper water chlorophyll concentration showing basically the primary producers in the ocean over the canyon. And this is um, a quick and easy way for the researchers to within just a few seconds to take in a pretty vast quantity of data. So if there's perhaps a theme in some of our use case presentations is the growing volume of data that, that we're all being inundated with and, and the, the difficulty of, of getting that data in a useful um, man, way to the decision makers, to people who can, can make, make sense of the data. So that's uh, a primary uh, goal of mine with employing these open source, long lived standards based software products to, to help, help in that process. So, um, and as part of that process, part of my job as a software engineer is to understand the, the use cases that, that the scientists have. And my, my last slide on this um, presentation is from the last page on that, on that news article where the shark bit the, the uh, autonomous underwater vehicle. And, and one of our engineers that goes out to sea is holding the, 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 baby, the baby tooth, but it was just a young tooth of the, of the shark that it was able to bite that whole, um, um, whole vehicle. So as an engineer, I look at the very technical side of things and say, well, how can we create better workflows using emerging capabilities in 3D space like GLTF and the GL um, binary format. Um, how can we make better use of the, the time sensor capability in X3D? And, you know, and uh, just to, to demonstrate um, um, the, the time sensor and, and the, the value of the, the, the community, um, here's, um, Here's a live web page of, of another campaign where we had uh, vehicles um, in, a, in a different campaign measuring sensors in the, in the uh, measuring uh, quantities in the ocean. And here's a HTML time slider that's wired to an X3D time sensor and I can just click and drag um, the vehicles through their platform. So this provides a, a nice way for just using standard web technology works in any web browser. And 
the power of the community of going on to the X3DOM GitHub page and saying, how, how can I wire a time sensor to do this? And it wasn't really completely straightforward to, to make this capability, but the community's there to help me as engineer to, to, to go through those um, issues. So, so the power of the community, the able, ability to combine uh, models from uh, SolidWorks with geospatial data from our NetCDF files and bring it all into a declarative format so that a, a web developer can build tools is, is, is very powerful. Looking forward, you know, we'd like to have a tile server capability for extremely large um, data sets and, you know, looking at having automated camera animation. So there's, there's a whole lot of things that I desire, but they don't necessarily match up with my, my end user's desire. And, and you can read this in an article, but our scientists talked about the communication between science and engineering kind of from an operational perspective, but I also see that as important from a, a, a 3D, um, 3D visualization. You know, we, as technologists, sometimes it, it takes effort to understand what our, our users need, needs are. So that's, that's all I have to present from our um, Ambari use case. And I think I pass it on to, to Nicholas now. So, Nicholas? Okay. Thank you, Mike. Um, let's see if folks can hear me. Yeah. So um, thanks again. I think this is, uh, it's always amazing um, when our members get together to see all the things that X3D is doing and, and what it's capable of. I'm going to do this really quick and I'll uh, happy to try to get us back onto, uh, onto track, but uh, just a, a few uh, highlights maybe of what we've been doing with X3D at Virginia Tech. Uh, probably one of the most notable ones was a, a paper that was published uh, at IEEE VR this spring. It was a nominee for best paper. We didn't, we didn't make it, but uh, you know, when we can use virtual reality to test things about human psychology. And in this case, we uh, made an experiment in my immersive projection environment called Cave. It's an X3D scene. We put people on the roof, the virtual roof, and watch their behavior uh, under different kinds of um, uh, safety interventions. And so um, that paper was, a, uh, was published in the spring and would definitely uh, encourage folks to take a look at that where, you know, out of uh, building and construction, human ergonomics, safety, uh, there again, X3D is uh, indispensable. Um, another kind of fun uh, one has been with the USGS. Uh, we've been working with um, a group up at their Shepherdstown location uh, doing citizen science projects. And uh, one of those uh, includes, I guess I'll move over to, uh, to this quickly. And um, just show you uh, sort of how, what we're doing is we're taking, uh, we're looking at how do uh, citizen scientists identify fish species. And of course they can be in all kinds of different locations or maybe there are different species of fish. And being able to uh, send a postcard to your teacher of the fish that you just identified uh, so that has been pushed out to uh, about 5,000 K-12 students, and uh, we were able to get some really interesting uh, information from that. I guess the last one I'll show, and of course these links will be available for you to, uh, oh, there's two more, be available. One is uh, Jefferson National Labs. We've been using X3D to visualize particle physics data. And um, also uh, something that I think is pretty exciting for folks is in X3D 4.0, of course, we're doing um, a new uh, node for point clouds, point properties. And I'll kind of show us a quick uh, demo here, and then I'll move it along. 
let's see. Point properties uh, lets us basically take those uh, take those point clouds from a lidar scan, for example, and uh, give it some different visual properties. Right, so we can change things like the attenuation um, according to the parameters of the spec and uh, point size, etc. So this is a, a kind of a demonstration of some of the new capabilities and applications we're we're using our X3D at Virginia Tech. So, thanks. Let's see, who's next? I will uh, do the, uh, I guess the, complete our use cases with a small example of a, a project I did. Uh, the overall point was to think of some interesting way to compare two, two 3D artifacts. Now, the particular case here was two human skulls from a bit of anthropology research, but I think you can see how this could be applied to two uh, similar bits of artwork, you know, sculptures uh, or coins or, or some other similar thing that you wanted to compare or, or, or two mechanical parts. And let me just, go to a live demonstration. So this is live from the website. The point is I, I have two three-dimensional skulls and uh, a researcher or just a student might be interested in comparing them and using X3D prepared a navigation system where by turning one skull or one object, the other one would track the same. So you could pretty straightforwardly uh, look at each artifact from the same point of view. As I say, the, you know, this, this is for a skull where an anatomist would look at it, but you can imagine its usefulness for two bits of art, sculptures and so on, or two mechanical parts where one perhaps had been damaged. So you want to compare a damaged part to an undamaged part. And uh, it's, it's, as, as user, user interfaces uh, should be, I, I think, I hope that it's fairly simple in scheme. You turn one and the other one tracks it and it works both ways. So either each one can be regarded as the, the primary and the other one will follow it. Uh, a bit of maybe something to look forward to, this works for rotating them. You can imagine you might also want to zoom in on a part and uh, again, you similarly zoom in and, and view the same expanded area of the other part. And I am confident that could be done with X3D. It's just a failure of my imagination of how to do it. I mean, I can think of ways to do it using complicated key presses and so on. But the point of a user interface is you should not need a manual to, to use the user interface. Uh, the takeaway is that X3D Gave, gave me the capability to prepare this scene, but now it's up to me or someone else to be creative and use, you know, prepare a useful uh, user interface. And later on, we hear from Dr. Feng Lu, a working group devoted to usability work. So let me just jump back to my presentation and do what I think of as the takeaways from this example. One is I, I developed a customized navigation system. That is this uh, idea of, of toggling or twinning two artifacts to be viewed from the same orientation. That by itself is not a particularly complicated graphics idea, but the, the usefulness of X3D was, Anita mentioned that X3D uses a declarative programming model. Um, that bit of navigation was implemented using the core X3D nodes. For those who are in the know, it was nodes from the navigation and the pointing device sensors. It did not require any language specific programming or scripting. It was just a matter of the, the X3D event driven programming model to tie those two artifacts together. 
Another takeaway is that navigation is included in the scene, so in the file you downloaded or in the file you gave to your users. So it could be customized to an individual case. If, it, if a slightly different implementation was useful for artwork or mechanical parts, that would be included in the scene that you distributed. It would not have to require modification of the browser. And finally, because it's based on the standard, uh, it will work on any X3D browser which, which implements the X3D standard. The live example I just showed was uh, in a web browser, but that same file is rendered in the same way on desktop applications and in future browser devices. The, well, the virtual reality devices or whatever else XVD is implemented on. I'm confident that this scene, this technique will work in, in, in those technologies as well. So I'm happy to have the opportunity to present this. And I think, I believe the next item is a Q&A session for the, these use cases. So I'm gonna turn it back to Mike Russelisi.